Hi, everybody, and welcome to Capitulo 7, Chapter 7, titled Que te gusta comer? Or What do you like to eat? Que te gusta comer? Um, so, if you weren't hungry before this video lecture, I assure you, you probably will be afterward. I actually, in the middle of making the PowerPoint, had to stop and have lunch and come back. So, um, anyway, grab you a bite to eat, settle in, and we're going to go through just a few new topics here that you're going to see in Chapter 7. So, some of, all of these topics do relate to food, obviously, and you have all kinds of really cool um, foods here. We have platanos up here at the top. A platano is a banana. We have Piñas, so pineapple, if you've ever had a piña colada, um, those are made of pineapple, obviously, piña, piña colada. Um, over here we have pepinos, cucumbers, el brocoli, broccoli, zanahorias, carrots, lechuga, lettuce, champiñones, mushrooms, um, a melon, um, a melon or probably a cantaloupe in this case, a melon, sandia, watermelon, naranjas, oranges, Papas, potatoes, cebollas, onions, duraznos, which are peaches, manzanas, apples, fresas, my favorite, fresas are strawberries, and then uvas, grapes. Okay, so you get some fruits there in the produce section. Uh, as we come over here, you get some um, more frequently seen condiments. So for example, we have la mermelada. Mermelada is jam or preserves, you might say, mermelada. We have la katsup. Katsup is uh, ketchup. We have mostaza, mustard, and mayonesa, mayonnaise. Over here we have some huevos, eggs, queso, cheese, jamón, ham, mantequilla, butter, pan, bread, crema. We would probably say sour cream there, crema. Um, and then pepinillos, pickles, pepinillos. So I want to tell you a funny story. Oh, and over here we have... Leche and cereal, cereal and milk. I want to tell you a funny story about mantequilla. I always have a, a few students who have trouble remembering mantequilla and that that means butter. So uh, if you look at mantequilla, it kind of spaces it out, out into little steps here. So you have man, your first syllable, man, te quilla. So man, that butter, it sure will quilla. It will kill you. Butter will kill you, right? Clog your arteries. Mantequilla. So butter. So corny joke there of the day. So this is part one, your vocabulary. These are just some words. These are on your vocab sheet. You can spend time studying your flashcards, but I always like to give you a little audio introduction with those. Um, you learned your numbers one through 99 in Spanish one. Here in Spanish two, we tend to look a little more at uh, the upper level numbers from 100 all the way to a million. So I'm gonna take a moment and go over a few of these that are a little weird. Um, so 100 is cien. When it becomes 200, we get dos cientos with this tos on the end. So cien, 100, dos cientos, 200. You can probably infer these are relatively normal. 100, cien, 200, dos cientos, tres cientos, cuatro cientos, seis cientos, ocho cientos. All pretty normal. There are three that are a little strange here. We have quinientos, we have sete cientos, and we have novecientos. So these aren't that strange. When you think about 15 and quince and you see quinientos, or you think about siete, seven, and you get setecientos, or noventa, ninety, and novecientos, not that difficult, but these three are a little strange. So again, uh, these are some that you probably will just memorize, but I wanted to point out, if you can remember doscientos, you can pretty much get to all of these except for five, seven, and nine. So something to consider there. At 1,000, we have mil. So 1,000 is mil. 2,000, dos mil. 3,000, tres mil. Um, 40,000, cuarenta mil. Okay, so you just keep going on and on and on. And then, of course, a million is un millón. Un millón. And a millionaire is a millonario. What we would all like to be, right? Um, so, millón. A million. Okay, so I think you have those give you some practice here with your vocabulary. These are questions you're actually going to see this week as you're working through these, but just wanted to take a moment and show some of these to you. So let's take a look at number one. It tells you that es una fruta roja, verde o amarilla. It's a fruit that's red, green, or yellow. Y es un regalo típico para los profesores. It's a, it's a gift, a typical gift for teachers or professors. What is it? You're probably saying it's an apple. That's true. Which one of these words over here means apple? Hopefully you're saying letter G, manzana. Manzana is an apple. 
Um, check out number six. It says, Las usamos para hacer vino. We use it to make wine, or we use them to make wine. Las usamos para hacer vino. What are we talking about? Good, it should be grapes. Las uvas. Las uvas. All right, I think you can do those. Uh, you also might have an activity like this this week where you have to tell me what is needed to prepare these certain items. Okay, so let's look here at number one. It says, una ensalada verde. Uh, so we're going to say, in order to prepare a green salad. So, para preparar una ensalada verde, necesitamos, necesitamos, we need, and we obviously probably need lettuce, um, so lechuga, lechuga, we also might need some tomates, cebollas, onions, tomatoes, lettuce, uh, you might put zanahorias in there, some carrots, y, gosh, what else would you put in your salad? Um, that's kind of the gist. Let's say you have espinajas, spinach, espinajas. So you have all those things. You're going to write these out. Check out another one. Look at number two. To make some vegetable soup. Para hacer or para preparar una sopa de verduras, necesitamos verduras. Necesitamos zanahorias, uh, maíz, we need corn, we need carrots, all that good stuff to make some vegetable soup. Okay. I want to give you some practice also with writing out these numbers. So 327 strawberries. You can probably look back that 300 was 300. So 300, 320, you probably remember, is 20 y 7. So 320 y 7 fresas. We have 327 strawberries. We better make a strawberry pie. Okay, now we're talking about 529 apples. Um, 500, you may recall, is not cinco cientos. 500 is quinientos. Quinientos. So here we have quinientos veinte y nueve manzanas. So spend some time practicing with those numbers. Um, we were talking a lot in our last video lecture in chapter six about the preterite, and we went over some. Uh, preterite endings for an AR verb, you remove the AR and add back a, aste, o, amos, aste, senaron. For an ER or IR verb, you remove that ER or IR and add back e, iste, io, imos, istes, or ieron for the they form. So you get all those all the way through. Um, and those were your regular verbs. So you took off your AR and you had hablé, hablaste, habló, hablamos, hablaste, hablaron. Comí, comiste, comió, comimos, comiste, comieron. You could conjugate hablar and comer in their preterite forms. Now, um, this chapter deals more with the irregular preterite, and I'm going to talk about why these are all irregular. We're going to go through some examples. So there's a little song here that I actually remember my high school Spanish teacher made me learn this song. We used to have to like do a dance to it, and it has just stuck with me ever since. I will never forget this. So we're going to go through each line, and then we're going to talk about each one individually. So um, this is sort of designed to be to the, the tune of a military dance. So, fui, di, vi, y se quise vine yo, and then usually students repeat, y se quise vine yo, tuve pude puse yo, tuve pude puse yo. Dije traje conduje yo, dije traje conduje yo, supe anduve estuve yo, supe anduve estuve yo. So this may mean nothing to you at first, but these are all of your irregular preterite words, and they're grouped in lines based on the type of irregularity that they have. So let's look at the first one, fui, di, vi. We call this group los verbos cortos, or short verbs, verbos cortos. You can see this song contains only the yo forms of all of these, hence why they all end in yo. Okay, so if we D and V, these are my verbos cortos. These are my short verbs. Um, they're, all, they're obviously called short verbs because they're really short. Um, and you see the yo form of ir and ser being fui, the yo form of dar being di, and the yo form of ver being vi. So with the understanding that if you can get to this yo form, you can kind of get to all the others. So um, if you want to say that I went somewhere, yo fui, I went a la playa, I went to the beach. Or tú fuiste a 
Walmart. You went to Walmart. Or ella fue a Dollywood. She went to Dollywood. Nosotros fuimos a Florida. We went to Florida. So on and so forth. Um, so your book makes a little note here of different strategies of how you can remember these words. You may choose that you want to make flashcards. You may use the Conjuguemos site that I listed in the content section of D2L to practice. Um, you may just sing that song a hundred times. Whatever works for you is fine, but you need to make sure you've committed these to memory. So, um, ir en ser, you get your fui, fuiste, fue, fuimos, fuiste, sin fueron. Dar, to give, to say I gave, we say yo di, you gave, tu diste, el, ella, usted, dio, he or she gave. Nosotros dimos, we gave, vosotros diste, you all in Spain gave, and ellos, ellas, ustedes, dieron. So, di, diste, dio, dimos, diste, and dieron. These are your dar conjugations. Uh, you can also hop down to ver and see that they're exactly the same as dar, except the d changes to a v. So, I saw, yo vi. You saw, tu viste. He or she saw, vio. So on and so forth. So, these are those first verbs in the verbos cortos category. Fui di vi. Um, our second line says, hice, quise, vine, yo. Um, these are all in what we refer to as the I group. So notice that they get an I. Uh, this is called the I group. You'll see some verbs that are similar. Again, these were just the yo forms, hice, quise, and vine. Um, so this is the verb hacer. Hice means I did or I made. Hiciste, you did or your, you made. Hizo, he or she did or he or she made, so on and so forth. So you have these converse, uh, these um, conjugations here. Ise, hiciste, hizo, with a Z. Notice that's a little regular too. Hicimos, hiciste, and hicieron. Notice these bolded endings. These are going to be the same for pretty much all of these song words. All these are regulars except for the J group. The J group have their own endings. All these others are going to follow the bolded endings that you see here. E, iste, o, imos, iste, hicieron. Um, so you'll notice there's three verbs here in the I category, ise, quise, and vine. We've talked about our conjugations for ise. You can probably assume your conjugations for querer and venir. Querer becomes quise, quisiste, quisiste, quiso, quisimos, and quisieron. So again, we just took the quis part and added the, our endings. Tell you a corny way to remember this one. Querer is to want. So think about um, someone's first date. He really wanted to give her a quise, a quise, a kiss. So quise, he, I wanted or he wanted. So quise, I wanted, quiso, he wanted. He wanted to give her a big quiso on the cheek. So remember it that way. Venir is to come. So to say that I came, I say vine. You came, viniste. He or she came, vino. We came, nosotros vinimos. And they came, vinieron. So you have all of these conjugations. Vine, viniste, vino, vinimos, vinieron. So all these are here for you as a part of that lovely I group. Okay, now you'll notice I've bolded two lines here, um, our third and fifth lines in the song. Uh, these are both known as the U group because they have all of these U's. Tuve, pude, puse. Supe, anduve, estuve, all with U's. Now, um, puse is the one that's been conjugated here for you. Puse comes from the verb poner, which means to put or to place. Yo puse, I put or I placed. Tu pusiste, you put or you placed. El, ella, usted puso, he or she put or placed, so on and so forth. Um, the weird part about all of these is really just the stem changes. So poner becomes pud, poner became pus. Saber becomes sup, tener becomes tuv, estar becomes estuv, and andar becomes anduv. So these are all here for you. Um, and they're all irregular, all part of this U group. Um, notice because they all change in some way to get a U in their stem. So I wish there was a better way to tell you to learn these other than just to practice and memorize them, but that fortunately is the best way. I do give you this song, so if you get stuck, you can always get back to the yo form. If you know your preterite endings, e, iste, o, imos, iste, sieron, you can complete any word in this song. So if you know the yo form of tener is tuve, 
Let me make a little box here. If you know the yo form of tenet is tuve, you can get to all the other forms by carrying down the tu part. Okay, so tuve, I had. You had, tuviste. He or she had, tuvo. We had, tuvimos. Vosotros had, tuvistes. And they had, tuvieron. So you can go through and conjugate any, any word in this song if you know your endings and you know the beginning of the word. So, fun fact there. Okay, and then finally, we're going to talk about this group, dije, traje, conduje, yo. You might have guessed we call this the J group, hence the J in each of these. Okay, so the J group's a little weird. Your endings for the J group are the same, e, iste, o, imos, istes, except for this last one. And you're probably thinking, well, it looks the same. Go back over here. Notice this ending, we have e, iste, o, imos, istes, but here we have ieron with an I, I-E-R-O-N, ieron. Whereas over here in the J group, we just have eron. There's no I there. So, uh, decir is one of the first words in our song. Uh, decir changes to dije, and decir is to say or to tell. So, I said, yo dije. You said, tu dijiste. He or she said, and ella usted dijo. So on and so forth. So, um, all of these other J group words work in the same way. You have conducir, to drive, producir, to produce, trae excuse me, traducir, to translate, and traer, to bring. So again, if you know these J-group endings, you can figure out any of these. Producir, produje, produjiste, produjo, produjimos, produjiste, produjeron. So you can go through and conjugate all of these. Traje, trajiste, trajo, trajimos, trajiste, trajeron, conduje, condujiste, condujo, condujimos, condujiste, condujeron. You can go through and conjugate all of these. Um, notice, Again, this third person plural, the they or y'all form is weird. It is not ieron, it's eron. Make sure you take note of that. So that was tons of information, and I don't expect you to remember every word of it. What I do want you to do for just a moment is go ahead and pause me for just a second. In this activity, I want you to go through and identify what verb uh, the underlined conjugation comes from. So for example, number one, the word fue. It's one of the first ones we talked about. It is in the um, first line of our song, the verbos cortos. And this was the he, she, usted form of ser or ir. Now this is tricky because ser means to be and ir means to go. So you have to look at the context of this sentence and decide if this comes from ser or ir. So la familia Martinez, the Martinez family, fue al restaurante Buen Gusto para comer. They went to Buen Gusto restaurant in order to eat. So if I want to say they went, this is the past tense of ir to say that the family went. La familia fue. Go ahead and pause me and try the rest of these, please. Okay, hopefully you've had a moment to try those. On number two, it says, El mesero vino a la mesa para darnos los menús. The waiter came to the table to give us menus. Vino comes from the verb venir, to come. Number three, el mesero puso el pan en la mesa. He put the bread on the table. To say that he placed or put the bread, puso comes from the verb poner. Number four, poco después, el mesero trajo la comida. A little afterward, the waiter brought the food. Trajo comes from the verb traer, which is to bring. Number five, last one, el mesero le dio la cuenta al señor Martinez. The waiter gave the bill to Mr. Martinez. Dar is the verb this comes from for to give. Okay, so if you were confused about any of this, you could always have looked back at our earlier slides um, where we have included all of these words for you here. So hopefully this is starting to make a little more sense. Recognition is our first step here. We're going to try now to start writing some full sentences, okay? So let's look at number four. It just says yo, and it says tener que, and I get to finish the sentence. So you probably remember from Spanish one, tener que is to have to. So I had to, we want to say in the past, tener becomes what now? Pui, di, vi, ise, quise, vine, yo, tuve. Oh, right, right, tuve. So yo tuve que, I had to um, mirar Netflix. It's a hard life. I had to watch Netflix. So yo tuve que preparar la cena. I had to make dinner, prepare dinner. Um, check out another one. Number three, it says, mis amigos y yo ir. My friends and I ir, we to go. So think back to ir, uh, our very first conjugation where we had fui, fuiste, fue, fuimos, fuiste, and fueron. Well, for my friends and I, which one of these conjugations would I use? 
Fui, fuiste, fue, fuimos, fuiste, se fueron. Hopefully you're saying fuimos because we went, nosotros fuimos. So mis amigos y yo, ir changes to fuimos. We went a la playa. We went to the beach. Fuimos a la playa. Okay, so it's probably the hardest thing I think this week for you to learn are those irregular preterites. You also see por and para. Por and para are often shortened as the two ways to say for in Spanish, for. Uh, they both mean for, and knowing how to use which one uh, is the hardest example. The hardest, um, sorry, excuse me. Knowing how to use each one is the hardest part. So I'm going to give you a few situations here. Um, sometimes these can also be translated other in other ways than for, but usually that is the most typical um, translation. So we're going to talk about por first, and then we'll jump into para. For por, we usually use por when we're talking about cause, reason, or motive. And it's often translated as because of or on behalf of. So the example that your book provides here is por la lluvia, no vamos a la piscina hoy. So for the rain, we're not going to the pool today. Or because of the rain, we're not going to go to the pool today. Uh, look at this example. Hicieron sacrificios por sus hijos. Hicieron is the irregular preterite form of hacer. We were just talking about a second ago. So hicieron sacrificios. They made sacrifices por sus hijos. On behalf of their children. They made sacrifices for their children. So in this case, both of these examples fall under the cause, reason, or motive purpose of using por. Um, the other common reason for por is when you're talking about exchange. So, él compró las piñas por 15 pesos. He bought the pineapples for 15 pesos. Or, gracias por el regalo de cumpleaños. Thank you for the birthday gift. So, in both of these cases, um, you made an exchange. Another common example would be a duration or a period of time. So, van a estar en el restaurante por dos horas. They're going to be in the restaurant for two hours. Uh, we're talking about a duration of time, so we're using por instead of para here. Um, also, when you're going through something, you often use por. So, Pedro caminó por el mercado. Um, Pedro walked through the market. Or, para llegar a la piscina, tienes que pasar por el gimnasio. To get to the pool, you have to go through the gym. So, por is often your... Um, your translation there for through. It can also mean by, in this case, could have been translated another way. Um, and then over here you have some common expressions that use por, so por ejemplo, for example, por eso, therefore, or that's why, por favor, you probably all heard this, please, por fin, finally, or por supuesto, of course. So common expressions there with por. Uh, as we look at para, there are oftentimes more reasons as to why we use para. Uh, the first is for a goal or purpose, and this is usually translated as in order to. This is my favorite use of para. So, vamos al mercado para comprar fruta. We're going to the market for the purpose of buying fruit, or we're going to the market in order to buy fruit. So, para is often translated as in order to. You can also use para um, when you're, someone is the recipient of an action. So, ella compró un regalo para su amiga. She bought a present for her friend. Um, the friend is the recipient, so in this case we're using para instead of por. I'm not saying she bought a present through her friend, during the duration of period of time of her friend, exchange her friend, or causing reason or motive for her friend. I'm saying she bought it for her friend, with her friend being the recipient of that action. A lot of times you use um, para also for destination. So salen para las montañas el sábado. They are going to the mountains on Saturday, or they're leaving for the mountains Saturday. So they're, that's their destination, the mountains. You use para with deadlines. So I could say that la tarea es para mañana. The homework is for tomorrow, or it's due tomorrow. That's the deadline. You also use para in funny sort of contrast examples. So para estar a dieta, él come mucho. For being on a diet, he eats a lot. So, uh, for contrast situations. And then, also, there are just some common expressions for para, just as we saw some common expressions for por a moment ago. So, para siempre, 
translates as forever. Para colmo, to top it all off, or my favorite, para nada. So if you really don't like something, you say, no me gusta para nada. I don't like it at all. No me gusta para nada. Uh, or para variar, for a change. So all of these are here for you. And then, of course, this chapter also brings in um, when you're adding con, which means with, along with a preposition. So instead of saying con mi, we say conmigo, or con ti, we say contigo. So with me and with you, conmigo, contigo. So the example your book gives is, vamos a comer contigo, we will eat with you. So some indications there for por and para. Um, the best thing I can recommend for you guys to do is go back and reference these two pages in your book as you're working on your activities. We're going to do a few examples together, but try to really think about it. The more that you speak Spanish and the, the more advanced your skills become, you don't think as much about when to use por o para, it just kind of happens naturally. So let's look at a few examples. Number one says, Ayer fui al supermercado. Yesterday I went to the supermarket. Blank comprar la comida de la semana. To buy food for the week. To buy this week's food. So I went to the supermarket for buying this week's food. Well, let's think about it. Would this be a cause, a reason, or a motive? Um, I'm not really translating it as because of or on behalf of. Would it be a period of time? An exchange? Going through somewhere? I don't know. Um, what about over here with Bada? Maybe it's a goal or a purpose, a recipient, a destination, a deadline, a contrast or an expression. What do you guys think here? I went to the supermarket blank to buy this week's food. The best translation here would probably be for or in order to. So I went to the supermarket in order to buy this week's food, in which case I should use para, because para translates as in order to. Let's look at a couple more. Number two says that siempre me gusta ir blank la mañana porque hay menos personas. I always like to go in the morning porque hay menos personas, because there are less people there. So, hmm, I always like to go in the morning. Sounds like I'm talking about a duration of time, a period of time. So I should use por here. Siempre me gusta ir por la mañana, in the morning. Okay, so hopefully you're getting the feel of these. Here's another couple of examples where you get to be creative. So number one says, voy al supermercado por. So I'm going to the supermarket por, and I get to make up a sentence. So let's think here. Uh, which one would be the best? An exchange, a duration of time, a cause, a reason, or a motive, or through? I would say most likely the period of time is a great example. So uh, we saw a similar one a second ago, but I could say voy al supermercado por la noche los sábados. I always go to the grocery store late at night on Saturdays because no one's there. Um, or... That was our poor example. Let's do a para example. So this says, voy al supermercado para. We're going to the supermarket in order to comprar leche. We're going to go buy some milk. Para comprar leche. Okay, so hopefully you're getting the hang of how these things work together. If you have any questions on these, just let me know. That's part one of our chapter, everything from the fruit vocabulary to your numbers to the irregular preterite to por empana. So you have a lot of information here. Um, please bear in mind this is very difficult, and I do expect you to spend some time working on these. In a traditional fall and spring semester, this would be one of those things where we spend a week talking about each topic, a week on vocab, a week on the irregular preterite, a week on por empana. Unfortunately, though, you guys just have one week for all of it. So... That's why you have these videos to help you and to reference. The second part of our vocabulary is one of my favorites. You get to go through and see all these awesome vocab words that have to do with being in a restaurant. So let's just go through a few of these. We don't have to go through all of them. Over here we have el arroz blanco, white rice. El pollo, chicken. El azúcar, sugar. El tenedor, a fork. El vaso a glass, not to be confused with a vase, el vaso, a glass, el plato, the plate, 
el cuchillo, the knife, la cuchara, the spoon, la sal, salt, los totopos, chips, el plato hondo, la pimienta, the pepper, el vino blanco, white wine, and then uh, la copa refers to the actual wine glass, so la copa. And over here you have el vino tinto, so red wine and white wine, el vino blanco and el vino tinto. A servilleta is a napkin. A mantel is referring to this blue tablecloth here, el mantel. Pescados, fish. And I think I hit all of them there. Okay, over here you have some other dishes and things. We have los entremesas excuse me, entremeses, which are your, um, you might say like an appetizer or a first course type thing. You have la ensalada Caesar, which is the Caesar salad, la sopa de tomate, tomato soup, el cocktail de cavarrones, a shrimp cocktail, and las quesadillas, so quesadillas. And then down here you have your main dishes, los platos principales. Uh, here we have el cerdo al horno, La carne asada, el sándwich de pavo, and la hamburguesa. So all kinds of meats here that you see. So carne, just plain old meat. Cerdo is a type of pig. Um, el sándwich de pavo, and la hamburguesa, hamburger. So you see all of these. Um, down here you see some postres as well. Postres are desserts. You have pastel, cake, flan, which is pretty obvious there. El helado de chocolate. Chocolate ice cream, la fruta, fruit. You have some bebidas down here, beverages, my favorite, café. El agua embotellada, bottled water. Um, you also might hear a botella de agua, bottle of water, but agua embotellada is the phrase that your book uses. You can have a cerveza, a beer. El jugo de naranja, orange juice, or some refrescos, soft drinks. So, again, you can spend time on your own sort of reflecting on those and studying with those, but I wanted to go ahead and bring those to your attention. Here is an activity you're going to have to do with these this week. Number one says, Tengo mucha sed. I'm so thirsty. Oh, my gosh. Quiero blank. I'm so thirsty. I want A, arroz, rice. Huh, I don't know. I want B, un pastel. I want a cake. I'm really thirsty. Oh, okay, maybe. No. C, I'm really thirsty. I want un refresco, soft drink. Okay, that one could be, be possible there. Or D, I'm really thirsty. I want un pollo. I want a chicken. Well, I would say that letter C, I'm really thirsty. I want a soft drink is probably your best, uh, best option there. Uh, number three tells you that mi café necesita más blank. My coffee needs more blank. It needs more A, taza. It needs more mug. Hmm. My coffee needs more mug. Well, unless it's laying on the floor, probably doesn't need more mug. Uh, B, my coffee needs more azúcar, sugar. Okay, now that, that could be plausible. Or C, it needs more cucharita, more little spoons. Mm, I don't know about that. Or D, it needs more sal, it needs more salt. Probably sugar is your best option here. So you can go through and fill in the most logical answer based on what you're hearing. Another example of this vocabulary that... Um, one thing you'll have to do this week is making sentences out of these that make sense. So look at the model example. It gives you desayunar cereal todos los días. So uh, to have cereal for breakfast every day. So in question form, you, you're you going to put this in the to form to ask a friend, do you eat cereal for breakfast every day? Desayunas. So we took off the AR and added an AS in the to form. So desayunas cereal todos los días. Do you eat cereal for breakfast every day? And the person said back, si, sí, siempre desayuno. I always eat cereal todos los días for breakfast. So, again, desayunar had the AR removed and an O added back. So, yes, I always eat cereal for breakfast every day. Let's look at another one here. So, I could ask on number six, if you eat in front of the television. So, I could ask you... Cenas frente al televisor. Do you eat in front of the television? And my person can say back, no. Yo no ceno frente al televisor. I don't eat in front of the television. Porque ceno en el comedor. I eat in the dining room con, con mi familia. With my fam. Familia. You can't spell. Okay. 
So do you eat in front of the TV? Nope, I do not eat in front of the TV because I eat in the dining room with my fam. So you can go through and kind of answer these as long as you answer them logically. It doesn't matter. This is just practice for you to have an opportunity putting these verbs in the to form with senas and in the, you form, the I form with seno. So you get to go through and practice those. What we're going to talk about next here has to do with direct object pronouns. Now, these can often be confusing for students, so I want to give you a moment just to talk about these and give you several examples. Don't stress about these guys. Um, I'm going to give you a few different examples. So typically, a direct object is usually asking what or whom about the verb. Um, a direct object can either be a person or an inanimate object, and usually the direct object is the noun that follows and receives the action of the verb. So look here at this first one. Lindsay llama a su novio John. Lindsay calls John. Remember, it's the noun that generally follows and receives the action of the verb. So who's she calling? She's calling John. Okay, so look at this example. Pablo compra un teléfono celular. Pablo buys a phone. He buys what? He buys a phone, un teléfono celular. So you can usually figure out what your direct object is by asking what or whom about the verb. So in this case, llama, calls is my verb. She calls what or whom? She calls John. Compra, buys is my verb here. She buys what or whom? She buys a phone. Your direct objects in Spanish are often translated as it or them. There's two ways to say it here. We have lo and la, with lo being masculine and la being feminine. To say them, we have los and las, with los being them, plural, and las being them, plural, as well. Los is masculine, las is feminine. So lo, la, los, and las, your two ways to say it and them. Occasionally, a direct object pronoun can also be a person, in which case you have me, translated as to or for me, te, to or for you, nos, to or for us, and os, to or for you all in Spain. So let's look at a few examples with these. So here in, in an in-person classroom, I would use my real students as an example, which I did here when I made this. Um, so Mr. Harrison says, Nate, Cuando ves a tu primo? When do you see your cousin? So when do you see what or whom? So in this case, the cousin is going to be my direct object. When do you see your cousin? Cuando ves a tu primo? If I want to say when do you see him, you can look back here and see that him is usually lo, in this case because we're talking about a guy and there's only one. So lo veo. So him I see. Esta noche, profesor. I'm seeing him tonight. Lo veo esta noche. Okay. Remember, as well, if you're talking in a conversation, you have to make sure you change correctly between first and second person. So we saw, cuando ves, when do you see? And this person answered with veo, I see. Check out this one. Blaine's girlfriend, la novia de Blaine, says, Me quieres de verdad. Two or for me, you love, right? You love me, right? Me quieres de verdad. So she used the me form. You love me. He answers back and says, yeah, I love you with all my heart. Si, te quiero con toda mi corazón. He doesn't say back, me quiero. Yeah, I love myself. He says, yeah, I love you. Te quiero. So make sure that you um, are alternating correctly between first and second person. I know these are kind of hard, so I'm going to give you a few examples. Um, a few more examples. Students often struggle with where exactly to put this direct object pronoun. Figuring out the what or whom is not usually hard. It's when we rewrite the sentence that we struggle with where to put it. Usually, if you want to be safe, the direct object pronoun always goes in front of the conjugated verb. There are cases where it can also be attached to the infinitive in a sentence, however, and I'm going to do an example for you both ways. So look at this one. It says, te voy a llamar. Esta tarde, to or for you, I'm going to call tonight, or this afternoon, sorry. I'm going to call you tonight. The to or for you went in front of I am going to call, my verb phrase here. So, te voy a llamar. I'm going to call you. To or for you, I'm going to call. It also could be attached to the end of the infinitive. 
I'm going to call you this afternoon. Voy a llamar te esta tarde. In this case, the te was attached to the end. So it can either go in front of your conjugated verb or it can be attached to the infinitive. Recall from Spanish 1, an infinitive is any word that ends in AR, ER, or IR. Up here, we see Brittany quiere comprar el vestido. Brittany wants to buy the dress. What does Brittany want to buy or whom does Brittany want to buy? Oh, she wants to buy the dress. So el vestido is my direct object. Would the dress be it or them? Good, the dress is probably it. And is vestido masculine or feminine? Am I going to use lo or la? You can look back here and see that dress, because it ends in an O, would be masculine. The masculine way to say it would be lo. So as I'm rewriting it, I can say, Brittany, lo quiere comprar. Or I can attach it to the end, and I can say, Brittany quiere comprar lo, attaching it to the infinitive. Either way, um, I find that generally, as I'm doing these, I tend to put it in front of the conjugated verb. Um, there are cases when it can be attached to the end as well. Both are totally correct, so don't stress about that. Whichever way is easier for you, go for it. Brittany lo quiere comprar or Brittany quiere comprarlo. Both mean that she wants to buy it. So, either way. Um, I want to take a moment now and give you a few of these to try on your own. So, as we look here, I'm going to let you quiz yourself for a minute. This young lady asks, ¿Tienes el sombrero? Do you have the hat? He's going to say, yeah, I have it. Well, you can probably tell that sombrero, hat, is masculine because it ends in an O. So to say it, am I going to say lo or la here? Hopefully you're saying lo because sombrero is masculine. Now she asks him, ¿Tienes la bicicleta? Do you have the bicycle? And he's going to say back, yeah, I have it. La bicicleta, excuse me, bicicleta in this case, to say it would become la. Si, sí, la tengo. Yeah, I have it. Do you have the guitar? Si, sí, la tengo, again, because guitar is feminine. Do you have the dinosaur? Tienes el dinosaurio? Si, sí, lo tengo. I have it, because dinosaur ends in an O. It's masculine singular, so I'm going to use lo. So, in your book this week, you're going to see some things like this. Um, and you're using the first drawing here as your example, but it asks, it gives you the verb comer, which means to eat, and ensalada, a salad. And student one says, ¿Quién come la ensalada? Who's eating the salad? And you answer and say, Eva, or Eva, is eating it. Eva la come. She's eating it. So Eva, in this case, has the salad. Salad was it, because there's only one, and it is feminine. So we use la instead of lo here. And I got Eva la come. Okay, look here. It says, tomar en sopa. So I'm going to say, who is drinking, or you might say eating, who is drinking or eating the soup? Quien tomar la sopa. So let's take and conjugate this. Quien tomar sopa. We know that tomar is going to become toma because we're conjugating in the he or she form. So who is having the soup? And it looks like Marcela is having it, so I can say Marcela blank toma. She is drinking it. So the soup, la sopa, is going to be replaced with la because sopa was feminine and singular. So Marcela la toma. Check out um, number two. We could ask who's serving tacos? Quien sirve los tacos? So if we're wanting to know who is serving the tacos, it appears in this case that Leo is the one serving the tacos, and I would say that Leo los sirve. He's serving them, okay, because tacos was plural, so I used the masculine plural ending, so Leo los sirve. He serves them. Okay, just a few more of these for you to practice. I had a lot of practice with this built in. Um, you also can use these, as we were discussing earlier, to talk about two or for me, two or for you, two or for us, or two or for you all, plural. So, as you see these, number one says, no te entiendo. I do not, two or for you, understand. So, I don't understand you, is what we're trying to say here. Notice, again, your 
direct object pronoun came before your conjugated verb of entiendo. So if we continue looking here, on number two, we see mi madre me llama todos los días. So mi madre, my mom, me, two or four me, calls, llama, todos los días, every day. So rather than I call my mother every day, my mother calls me every day. Mi madre me llama todos los días. And then you'll have some sections where you have to answer a certain question. So let's look at this one. And let me throw a text box down here to type in. Number one says, ¿Quién me llama? Who, two or four me, calls or who's calling me? You could answer and say back, Hector me llama. Hector, two or four me, he calls. Hector calls me. Or you could say back, Hector te llama. Hector's calling you. Okay, so if I'm asking somebody who's calling me, that person's probably going to say back, Hector is calling you, Hector te llama, not Hector is calling me. Look at another one. You might ask a friend, me ayudas con la tarea? Two or four me, would you help with the homework? Would you help me with the homework? The person can say back, si, te ayudo. Yeah, two or four you, I will help. Or they could say back, B, yeah. Two or four me, you will help. <laughs> so will you help me with the homework? Yeah, you'll help me. <laughs> no, you would say back, yeah. I will help you, te ayudo. So number three should be A. So I hope this video has been helpful to you. As always, if you have any questions about our content of our course, feel free to give me a yell. Have a great day, everyone.